Um, so yes, I'm, I'm a data scientist at Groupon. I'm currently actually towards the end of a leave of absence to teach for the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship. Um, and I'm going to talk about a customer lifetime value system that we built at Groupon that is now in production. I uh, built this system with uh, several other of my colleagues at Groupon, uh, one of whom is Adyan Pandey, who's still at Groupon. And then there's also Angela Han, who's currently at Google, and Rajesh Parekh, who is at Facebook. So at Groupon, we're, we're trying to merge, in a lot of ways, the online and offline experiences. So we're connecting customers and merchants. And this comes with it um, many challenges. So I'm only listing a few of them here. Um, we are trying to develop a very robust uh, online marketplace across several different types of commerce, including, uh, in particular, local businesses we're partnering with. Um, we also have a, a goods business, which is physical merchandise and travel business through our getaways, uh, our getaways channel. Um, we're also trying to build a daily habit for our customers. We want to keep our customers coming back and searching on our site every day. And then um, we're continuously innovating on our products, both on, um, through our website and through our mobile app. And so through these challenges, there's a huge host of questions that we ask ourselves every day. I put a few of them down here. So uh, in terms of developing robust marketplace, how does, for example, featuring the local burger chain down, a uh, local burger place down the block compare to featuring a big chain when it comes to increasing our users' future spending. Um, given the number of local choices a customer has, how many Groupon options do we provide to promote a daily habit? And then um, what's the added value of various other business decisions that we can make, including providing what you might call white glove customer service? So, so in order to answer these types of questions, we have to have uh, a robust understanding of customer value, and that includes both value in the past and then also value in the future. So this uh, talk is about customer lifetime value, um, CLTV, I'm going to call it. And uh, this is a prediction of the net dollar value that we can attribute to our future relationship with each individual customer. So there are many use cases for these types of systems. Um, the most direct is customer relationship management. So uh, if you have a good understanding of customer value and how it changes with time and how it responds to various stimuli, you can find the highest value customers most likely to attract, customers most likely to make their first purchase, and then you can personalize the treatment of each of these different types of customers. Um, you can also analyze user behaviors, uh, do product experimentation beyond the typical A-B experimentation that looks for short-term returns. You can now focus on more long-term returns. And um, you can also use these predictions as performance metrics in all uh, areas of the business. So what we built and what I'm going to describe is a new system for the modeling and daily tracking of uh, future customer value. So this system is novel in a few different ways that I will discuss. Firstly, um, we, we try to use a very comprehensive feature set, and that feature set also includes features that quantify the level of engagement that each customer has with us on each of our platforms. Um, we also use separate models for different types of purchasers so that we can allow for varying feature weights. Uh, and so that includes, for instance, uh, one-time buyers and um, versus very active users would have different feature weights. And then uh, we make uh, the daily running of our model far more economical techni uh, technically by rescoring users only when certain trigger events occur and then applying uh, an empirical decay function otherwise. And so I'm going to go on now and discuss each of these different things. So first off, the feature set that we use, uh, we're, like I said before, we're trying to capture all areas of the Groupon customer's experience. So a uh, very, very important type of feature is uh, those related to user engagement. Um, so for our emails, we track opens and email clicks. And then uh, on our mobile app, we look at uh, things like opens and deal views and searches. And then we coalesce those behaviors and counts of those behaviors into composite scores for each platform. 
We also look at all areas of the user experience. So that includes uh, the quantity and also the quality of nearby deals for each customer. Uh, it also includes whether each customer has had refunds or uh, interactions with customer service, including how long did they wait on the phone for customer service and if they had positive or negative survey responses afterwards. And we also track shipping times for our goods, uh, physical merchandise business. Um, we also, of course, use the standard features relating to user behavior, so including, uh, of course, purchase history. We also look at redemption behavior. So when you purchase a Groupon, typically you have to bring that Groupon to a merchant to redeem it. So we keep track of how long it takes each customer to redeem their Groupons. And then um, do they even redeem them at all? Do they let them expire? We also look at channel preferences. For instance, uh, some customers prefer to buy local deals, whereas some customers prefer to buy physical merchandise deals. Um, and then we also, of course, use demographics like uh, gender and age and home location. So if someone lives in the suburbs versus the city center. So regarding our engagement features, um, these are uh, very important features in our set because they act as an early warning system for, uh, on one hand, disengagement, and then on the other hand, re-engagement. So often customer lifetime value modeling systems rely very heavily on purchase history. But um, what do you do if you have a customer who might only purchase once or twice a year? So um, we are able to model those types of customers much more accurately um, by using their engagement with different, uh, different platforms. So we take key behaviors and we produce one composite score. So I have an example here in this very um, basic equation for a type of email engagement score that you could define. So um, let's say you wanted to um, track both email opens and then email clicks over some time window, so say 90 days. So over that time period, you're gonna count up these two behaviors and then we combine them into one composite score by weighting them based on the conversion rate for each of those behaviors. And those conversion rates are calculated from historical data. So the other aspect um, of our modeling that's a bit different is that we uh, model different user segments separately and that's because feature importances will be different for different types of customers. So for example, if you have users who purchase extremely frequently, and I'm gonna call those our power users, um, for those users you can pretty much do a time series analysis and predict their future behavior based on their past purchasing behavior. But what do you do if you have a user who's actually never even purchased in the first place and might just be first um, doing their initial exploration of your site? So you can't use purchase history features with those types of customers. And so um, to mitigate these types of issues and to allow for differing feature weights, we divide our users into what I'm gonna call purchase cohorts based on their patch purchase frequency. So um, this is a subset of them. And uh, in the following slides, I'm going to be referencing uh, new users. So those are users who've been around for um, not really long enough to detect a pattern yet. Um, we have some users who've never purchased. So they come to our site and they look around, but they haven't made that first purchase yet. Uh, we have one-time buyers. Those are customers who've come to us once, purchased once, and then left and never came back. Uh, and then we have varying levels of frequencies of more regular purchasers, uh, such as sporadic buyers and what I'm gonna call power users. And the thresholds that divide these different um, types of users, so what, what, what is sporadic and what is a power user, that would depend on each, uh, each specific business. So our model, um, as it is right now, predicts customer value uh, in a few different time windows. So currently they're 90 days, six months, and one year uh, time horizons. And we make these predictions every day. So these time windows are all on a rolling basis. So for example, for our 365 day predictions, um, if I were to predict that today, it's gonna be for one year following today, and then tomorrow that one year window is gonna shift by one day. So we're predicting all of these on a daily cadence using separate models for each of our user segments. And the model itself is a two-stage random forest model. Um, we did a lot of experimentation with um, several different types of machine learning algorithms, and we found that random forest works best for this type of application. 
So stage one is to predict a binary purchase propensity. So are they going to buy in the next X days? And then stage two is to predict the dollar amount for those users who were actually predicted to purchase. And then there are a um, few other complications to, to doing this type of model. So um, for one, we had to do some class balancing because some of these different purchaser cohorts get very uh, unevenly distributed between the purchasing and not purchasing sides of things. So for example, um, one-time buyers are far more, are far, uh, far less likely to buy in the next 90 days than to buy, whereas a power user is extremely likely to buy in the next 90 days versus not buy. Um, we also um, fine-tune the classification cutoff between not buying and buying for a model as to uh, minimize the bias in the total number of purchasers, and that's just based on uh, business requirements. And then, of course, uh, Groupon is very seasonal business, so we did seasonality adjustments, and those were done on an empirical basis by measuring historical seasonality factors and then applying them after the fact. So one way in which we dramatically uh, reduce the, the technological cost of doing daily predictions on hundreds of millions of users is by leveraging our knowledge of user behavioral patterns. So I'm showing here a graph of what I'm calling the decay function. So what this is, is on the x-axis, we have the number of days since the last interaction with us. And then on the y-axis is a normalized average 90-day future purchase, or per future purchase value for these users. And these aren't predictions from a model. These are actual values. And so um, the higher curve, the, the, the curve with, curves with the higher value are for what we call our power users. And the curves with the lower value are for what we call the sporadic buyers. And um, the users are further broken out in terms of what we call activation cohorts. So that's the year that each of these users made their first purchase. So we see that the lines um, for power users and sporadic buyers are very different. So we measure this decay function on a cohort purchase cohort basis, but we found that um, there are various other demographic variables such as your first purchase that actually don't seem to affect the average decay function. So we use this um, in the following way. So on any given day when we're going to make fresh predictions for everyone, we find users who had what I'm calling any trigger events, so that's any interactions with us. And then if a user has had any interaction with us, that's going to change their feature set. So then we rescore those users using our model. And then for users who have not had any trigger events, we, um, we then use this decay function that we've measured empirically from historical data to then adjust their score down accordingly. So I'm now going to show some, um, some charts regarding the performance of each stage of our model. So remember that stage one is a binary prediction, yes or no. Is this user going to purchase in the next X days? So these are the results for a 90-day purchase, which is actually the most difficult of our time windows because it's very short and customer behavior is very noisy. So these are just the ROC curves for um, four of our purchase cohorts. So new users, one-time buyers, sporadic buyers, and power users. Um, so this is just the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And then for stage two, um, this is where we're actually measuring the, um, the actual dollar value in these future time windows. So the top chart, the top table, is showing you the correlation coefficients between actual and predicted. So we're showing Pearson and Spearman correlation coefficients. Uh, each row is a different purchaser cohort. So we have um, unactivated, means never purchased before, new users, one-time buyers, sporadic buyers, power users, and then what we get overall. And then going column by column left to right, um, short P and short S, those are the Pearson Spearman correlation coefficients for the short time scale, which is 90 days. And then next to that, we have the medium time scale, which is six months. And on the right, we have the long time scale, which is one year. And we find that all the correlations are highly significant. Um, all the p-values are below 0 0.001. We find that pr um, predicting on the longer time window is far easier to do accurately than predicting on the short time window because customer behavior 
is very noisy, and so averaging it out over a longer window definitely helps. And then we find that there are some purchaser cohorts that are far easier to predict than others. So for example, our power users, um, if you're going to predict a power user is going to buy, it's pretty easy to predict how much they are going to buy because it's so related to how much they bought in the past. Whereas for a sporadic buyer, um, these are people who may only buy once or twice a year. So if you want to predict how much they're going to buy in the next 90 days, uh, that becomes very difficult. So the correlation coefficients are a lot smaller for them. And then in the table below, I'm showing the RMSE for each cohort, for each time window. Again, we generally find that power users have the lowest RMSE, and the long time window is the easiest to predict. So since we have predicted for each purchase cohort separately, um, there are going to be different feature weights for each cohort. And so here I'm showing the, some of the, the top features that we find um, in terms of Gini and Purity Index for uh, our power users on one end of the spectrum and then our one-time buyers on the other end of the spectrum because I had mentioned them before. So for power users, we find that indeed the most, um, the most important features are those relating to purchase history. So that includes value uh, over the past quarter, year, um, their lifetime, and then how many days has, has it been since their most recent purchase. And then for one-time buyers, we find, um, of course, very different most important features. So these include their email engagement score, so whether or not they've been opening and clicking their emails. Um, the, one of our features is the average number of orders per quarter per subscriber in their home city. So that's uh, basically product uh, uh, um, proxy for local uh, Groupon knowledge. And then um, whether or not the user has downloaded the mobile app, and then the number of days since their last and only purchase. So the longer it's been since they made that one purchase, the less likely they are to buy it again. So just to show you, um, just to mention a couple use cases for this and how we're using these results at Groupon. Uh, the most direct way you can use them is for user segmenting. So this is telling us um, the user's long-term value, so their future value as it relates to their past value. So here's just an example of just a small sample of users in the scatter plot where the x-axis is their current or most recent value and then the y-axis is their predicted value. So now using this, you can separate user or, or customer base into those who are gaining value, which would be uh, above the diagonal line, those who are losing value, um, users who are consistently active, and then users that are either disengaging or users who are, might be engaging with us for the first time. And so this provides a useful framework um, for, say, marketing to, to uh, start doing some experimentation where they can uh, then determine the optimal target audiences for various personalized treatments, including promotional offers, and then uh, even customer service treatment if we find that there's a specific um, reason why a customer is declining in value, for instance, a refund or a slow shipping time. And then we also use these results for user behavior analysis and product testing. So just to show a couple examples of how our model results respond to various user uh, behaviors. On the left, I'm showing what happens when a user unsubscribes from Groupon emails. And on the right, I'm showing what happens when a user downloads the mobile app. So these are for a few of our purchase cohorts. This is showing the average predicted 90-day value um, on the y-axis. And we see that when users unsubscribe from emails, the model responds by uh, de reducing their their predicted future value, and when they download the mobile app, their um, predicted future value spikes up. And that's largely because of these engagement-related features that we have introduced into our model. So when people stop interacting with their emails, they lose value, and when they start interacting with the mobile app, they then gain value. So here are some of our future plans for this. Um, as I said, the, the prototype, the first version of this is in production and running and has been running for about a year now. Um, we're testing more machine learning frameworks beyond uh, the standard random forest. 
And then we also are adding features, and those include uh, engagement scores for other types of interactions beyond email and the mobile app, and then also requests from our various business partners who are using these models. Um, we are starting to evaluate longer term trends in all of our results and to look at um, the loss and gain in value due to future events and then also quant quantifying the business costs associated with uh, all the different types of model errors. And uh, in general, we're going to continue to iterate in tandem with our business units to develop the system and uh, make it more useful to the company. Thank you. One is that uh, customer experience uh, satisfaction is that uh, a feature that you are using and how important it is. So that's the first question. Uh, a second suggestion is uh, the novelty factor. Uh, so if you give some user, especially uh, the sporadic user or new user, a novel experience and then somehow they got hooked, uh, whether that makes a, you know, a, a contribution to the lifetime uh, value. So um, uh, uh, what kind of experience? In the second question, what did you say? Uh, the novelty factor. Oh, novel, novel yeah. experience. Okay. It's like they have never tried yoga class, and then they try yoga class, they really like it, uh, okay. and then purchase more. Yeah. OK, uh, that's a really good question. So um, in terms of um, user satisfaction, um, we don't actually have, like, so the data on user satisfaction in general is um, right now extremely sparse. So we do have um, ratings that users can give various merchants when they do use their Groupons. And then we also do customer surveys with smaller focus groups of users. So, um, so we could use that kind of data. But in general, um, those kinds of reviews are not available for the vast majority of our customers. So, so it would be a very, very sparse feature. Um, and then regarding um, giving new users a more novel experience, um, that's a really good point. So in, uh, in all of our um, product testing and then also in our um, relevance team, we are now segmenting new users as a different type of user and trying to um, modify their experience separately to see what works best to get users to make their first few purchases. And the theory is that then once they get hooked, then they'll keep coming back. So that is something that the business is actively doing. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the last chart you showed. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, effect of unsubscribing from email and also downloading the app. Yeah. Did you normalize for the effect between those two? For example, I might download the app, and since I downloaded the app, I might unsubscribe. In that yeah. case, my engagement still continues, probably. Yeah, that's a great question. So in this graph, I've, I've separated out those users. I'm not including them. Cool. But that is something that we do generally see. Lots of times, those two behaviors will come together. That's Thank definitely you. right. And so, so one of the things that we want to do is when a user unsubscribes from email is to give them a chance to download the mobile app, because they might be the type of user is more likely to use the mobile experience. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in the calculation of uh, email engagement score, uh, it is mentioned that the weights are the historical conversion rate, rates. So uh, is the historical conversion rate calculated by just the last touch, or is it uh, calculated by uh, waiting upon uh, all the uh, email uh, clicks in the past few days? It's the second thing. It's calculated based on all of the clicks and opens. Uh, in that case, is it uniformly uh, weighted, or is it uh, in what kind of uh, distribution yeah. is it weighted on? Um, so it's not actually calculated for each individual customer. It's calculated for uh, our whole customer base um, as a whole. So historically, in the past however many days over which we're calculating this, and it gets recalibrated re pretty frequently, um, we look at, um, of all the users' clicks, all the clicks and email opens that we have, what was the uh, average historical conversion rate from all of those lumped together? So it's not done for each individual customer. I think we have time for only a couple more questions. We'll do one here and then one over here. Thanks. Yeah, I was curious about how you end up using this in your business. So, for example, if you run an A/B test, would you uh, check the impact on the lifetime value, or is that too coarse a metric in that kind of context? 
Yeah, so it actually um, is currently being incorporated into our A-B testing. Um, there are lots of issues with using customer lifetime value in A-B testing. One of them is that the user has to be logged in so that we can uh, connect them to the predictions that we have for them. So um, in that way, it makes it a less, and also it's a, um, the variance is very large. So it's, it acts more like you know, a revenue measure as opposed to a conversion me measure in an A-B experiment. So there's several reasons why it would not be the first line thing that you would use in an A-B experiment, but it is something that um, after the fact, after you um, have run an experiment, you can then, it's, it's worked into our experimentation platform, so you can then analyze it after the fact. Uh, thanks, I really enjoyed reading this paper and, and the talk, so thanks for writing it and coming and talking about it. Thanks. Uh, one thing that struck me, however, was that um, you're training a random forest, and then you, you're actually training like loads of completely separate random forests, aren't you? For one for each customer group, and then for each time period. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And so I wonder why you didn't use the customer type as a feature in the forest. I mean, did did you try that and it didn't work that well? Um, yeah. So that's a really good point. Um, the customer type. Um, comes about kind of as a feature because we uh, have the purchase history on a variety of timescales as features. And the purchaser cohort is based on the frequency of their past purchasing. Um, we found that, yeah, it worked a lot better to have completely different feature weights for the different kinds of customers. So, um, so yeah, we did look into that. Okay, that's just, I find that quite surprising because then you're not sharing any statistical weight from across customer groups. But I guess what works, works. Well, and also we, we, we also have the benefit of having a giant amount of pool of data from which to train. So we didn't have any limitations in that, in that sense. All right, thank you. Thanks.